So hi to all the viewers. I hope my uh, screen is visible and I'm audible too. So let's start the session. I'm Dr. Karthik Vijay Kumar. I am uh, the faculty at Doc Tutorials for endocrinology for both NEET SS and INISS. And I'm also working as a consultant endocrinologist in Government Medical College, Thiruvananthapuram. So today we are going to discuss an extremely important topic that is the guidelines on diabetes mellitus, which is published by the American Diabetes Association on December, 2022. And they have named it as the Diabetes Guidelines for the year 2023. So as you may be aware of, there are many professional organizations that have given guidelines for diabetes mellitus, starting from the RSSDI in India, the European Association for Society of Diabetes in uh, Europe, and there are other organizations also like American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. So, but ADA stands out apart from all these. Why? Because it is by far the most commonly followed and most cited professional guidelines and is followed by the physicians and endocrinologists worldwide as the last statement regarding the uh, diabetes mellitus management. So in this year, they have divided the entire sessions into 17 chapters, and it is virtually impossible for me to cover all the details, all the important aspects in these 17 chapters. So, and the detailed discussion of the important areas in all these headings is covered in Doc Tutorials app, and that will be releasing in the application shortly. So in this session, my aim is to give you an overview regarding the guidelines, the recent revisions, and the important aspect with respect to the management in your day-to-day -day practice, as well as to mention the important points that could come in your upcoming entrance examinations. So today I'll be focusing on these seven chapters and we'll be dealing with each of them one by one. So meanwhile, you can uh, type in your queries in the chat box and I'll be taking the all the questions continuously towards the end of the sessions so that the session is not interrupted and you can uh, post your queries in the chat box in the YouTube live. So the first regarding the classification of diabetes mellitus, there is no major revisions put forth by ADA this time around. As you know, diabetes has been classified into four, the type one, type two, specific types of diabetes, and finally, gestational diabetes mellitus. Now, one interesting point with regards to ADA classification is that they have removed the previously existing type 1A and type 1B regarding the autoimmune and non-autoimmune forms of type 1 diabetes. They have removed that and also how it differs from the WHO classification of diabetes mellitus. Very important as it has no mention about the hybrid forms of diabetes. So what are the hybrid forms of diabetes? Two things that you are well aware of. They are the latent autoimmune diabetes of adults and the ketosis prone diabetes. So what is LADA? LADA is nothing but a sub-variant of type 1 diabetes according to ADA. The, those individuals who had a milder disease type of type 1 diabetes who will have partial beta cell destruction at diagnose and odd follow-up, they will progress to complete beta cell loss. So LADA is considered as a subtype of type 1 diabetes in ADA classification. And second, regarding ketosis prone diabetes, you must be aware of the A beta classification of ketosis prone diabetes. And it is well known that type 2 diabetes patients are more likely to present as ketosis prone diabetes, or those patients who fall under KPD mostly have a phenotype confirming to that of type 2. So, ketosis prone diabetes is considered a subvariant of type 2 diabetes in ADA classification. So this is how ADA largely differs from WHO with regards to the classification. Now about the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus, no changes have been made. So you have four criteria and the patient need to satisfy at least one of them. You have a fasting plasma glucose criteria and which is 
nothing but the 126 milligram per deciliter or 7 millimole per liter. And the fasting has been defined as no caloric intake for at least eight hours. Then you have the two hour postprandial glucose after an OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, where 75 gram of anhydrous glucose is dissolved in water. Of course, you have so many precautions before the patient can undergo an OGTT. Then you have HbA1c, cutoff of more than or equal to 6.5 percentage is the cutoff. And finally, you have the last criteria, a patient with a random plasma glucose of more than or equal to 200 milligram per deciliter with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis. So what are hyperglycemic crisis? They include either diabetic ketoacidosis or diabetic ketoacidosis or hyper or smaller hyperglycemic state. So either that or the patient should have some classic symptoms of hyperglycemia. So what are the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia? Recently, there has been some controversy with regards to that. Previously, we described three Ps, the polyuria, the polydipsia, and polyphagia as the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia. Now, the ADA recognizes polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss as the characteristic symptoms or the classic symptoms of hyperglycemia. And polyphagia is no longer considered a classic symptom of hyperglycemia. That is also one point that you need to take note of. Now, extremely important point, screening for type 2 diabetes. So do we need to screen all patients who are coming to your OPD for other complaints or you have to screen general population for the presence of type 2 diabetes? So ADA has mainly divided the screening population into four. One is those who are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Second, those patients who have been diagnosed as having pre-diabetes. Third, women with history of gestational diabetes mellitus. And fourth, universal screening. Those with no risk factors, those who doesn't come under the previously mentioned categories. Now, what are those individuals whom we define as high risk for developing type 2 diabetes? So they include those with a first degree relative of diabetes, those coming or falling into high risk race or ethnicity, those with a history of cardiovascular disease, those with history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, females with polycystic ovarian syndrome, those who don't have any physical activity, and finally, those with phenotypic manifestations of insulin resistance. So these are the high risk categories for developing type 2 diabetes. So in these individuals, at any point of time after the age of 10 years, okay, after the age of 10 years, if the patient is either overweight or obese and belongs to any of these high risk characteristics, you should do a screening test for diagnosing type 2 diabetes. That could either be a fasting plasma glucose, two hour postprandial glucose, HbA1c, or a random plasma glucose if the patient is having symptoms. So with any of these diagnostic tests, you will have to screen for type 2 diabetes in a patient who is overweight or obese with any of these high-risk characteristics. That is the take-home message. Now, what about pre-diabetes? As you know, pre-diabetes is the fasting plasma glucose lying between 100 and 125 milligram per deciliter and two hour postprandial glucose after OGTT lying between 140 to 199 milligram per deciliter or A1C lying between 5.7 to 6.4 percentage. So if an individual is diagnosed to be having pre-diabetes, then he should undergo testing for diabetes every year because it is said that around 10 to 15 percentage of pre-diabetes gets converted to overt diabetes every year. So you'll have to test for that every year in a pre-diabetes patient. Now, what about gestational diabetes mellitus? So gestational diabetes mellitus, women who had delivered a baby and who had GDM during pregnancy should be tested every three years throughout their life because there is 50 percentage lifetime risk of contracting type 2 diabetes. Now, in general population, without any risk factors in those who are not having risk factors, they also should have diabetes screening from 35 years of age. Very important point. This revision, previously it was 45 years. 
and it was brought down from 45 to 35 in the ADA 2022, that is in the last year guidelines. So they have also retained that change this year also. Now, a concept regarding the remission of diabetes mellitus, a favorite question in your entrance examination also, how are you going to define the remission in type 2 diabetes? So there is different or several myths uh, revolving around the remission and reversal of diabetes, whether reversal is possible or it is just remission of diabetes where the patient is euglycemic only for a transient period and only to relapse later. So there is controversy with regarding definition. But remission of diabetes means as per the latest guidelines, A1C maintained for less than 6.5 percentage for at least three months without the use of OHA and insulin. That is the definition of remission of type 2 diabetes. So the patient has stopped oral medications, stopped all insulin regimes, and still the A1C is kept less than 6.5 percentage for at least three months. Then you can say that the patient is in remission. Now about the prevention of diabetes mellitus, any role for any lifestyle modification or drug therapy in prevention of diabetes mellitus. The current guidelines have given specific emphasis to these three aspects. One, metformin. Second, lifestyle changes. And third, bioglitazone. So what is the role of metformin in the prevention of diabetes? So it is important that the pharmacotherapy for prevention of diabetes is used only in those who has been diagnosed with pre-diabetes. So the studies supporting the use of these pharmacotherapeutic agents only exist in the preventing the occurrence of diabetes mellitus in a patient who is already having pre-diabetes. This not in general population or in individuals without any risk factors. So the studies have evidence only for preventing conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes. So where is metformin used in a patient with pre-diabetes? So metformin is indicated if an individual with pre-diabetes comes within the age range of 25 to 59 years, with a BMI of more than 35. Of course, this 35 is a Western data, so you can probably extrapolate to around 30 kilograms per meter square as far as the Asian population is concerned or the or Indian population. And the fasting plasma glucose of more than 110 milligram per deciliter, HbA1c of more than 6% or previous gestational diabetes mellitus. So pre-diabetes patient, belonging to an age group of 25 to 59 years with any of these features, high BMI, high fasting plasma glucose, high HbA1c, and history of GDM. So these are the eligibility criteria for prescribing metformin in a pre-diabetic individual. Now, what is the role of lifestyle changes in preventing diabetes? So we had an, uh, evidence from an extensive trial and a very elaborate trial in the form of diabetes prevention program where we compared the lifestyle changes versus metformin in preventing the conversion from the pre-diabetes to diabetes state. So it has been shown that lifestyle changes is more efficacious than metformin in preventing the pre-diabetes to diabetes conversion. So the prescribed physical activity is at least 150 minutes per week aiming for at least 7 percentage weight loss. So this can bring about a reduction in the rate of conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Now, what is the role of bioglitazone? In the recently conducted NEETSS September session 2022, we had a little controversy because it was uh, there was a question asked which of the following drug was uh, used to prevent the con uh, or the delay the progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Metformin and bioglitazone both were in the options. So the ADA recommends only metformin for the reduction in the diabetes events in the pre-diabetes cohort. So what is the utility of bioglitazone? Although it has got the backing from evidence for delaying the diabetes onset, ADA recommends bioglitazone only to lower the risk of stroke myocardial infarction. Although it has effect in reducing progression to DM, the primary aim of bioglitazone in a pre-diabetes individual it is to lower the macrovascular event because it has been well documented that the patient need not progress into overt diabetes mellitus to develop macrovascular events. 
it can occur even at the stage of pre diabetes so pioglucosan from the available evidence has been found to be useful in that regards now comorbidities in diabetes mellitus very very important often overlooked statement especially in clinician and practicing physicians so the conventional comorbidities when you say comorbidities associated with diabetes mellitus the first things that comes to your mind would be systemic hypertension dyslipidemia non alcoholic fatty liver disease etc and you have another set like the complications the microvascular complications and the macrovascular complications but the diabetes comorbidities is beyond this trio is beyond this hypertension dyslipidemia and nephrology so it encompasses a whole lot of things ranging from cognitive impairment presence of fractures presence of hearing loss strong association with periodontal disease and hypogonadism especially in males and pcos in females so when you are evaluating a patient with diabetes you should look beyond this trio of comorbidities to these factors the cognitive impairment the fractures the hearing loss the periodontal disease and hypogonadism so for all the practicing doctors out there this is a message i want to convey you have to look beyond this common comorbidities and these things are often overlooked for example the periodontal disease if it is present can hamper with the glycemic control and this can cause an increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease also so it is extremely important to have a clear understanding regarding the comorbidities in diabetes mellitus now what are the glycemic targets so conventionally we had three targets one for fasting plasma glucose second for postprandial and third for a1c and it has not changed for the last 3 to 4 years the fasting target is 80 to 130 mg per deciliter the postprandial the peak postprandial glucose should be less than 180 mg per deciliter a1c for an average type 2 diabetes patient it is less than 7 percentage but ada it goes beyond that and it gives more flexibility to this hba1c target and it says that a1c cut off of a bit relaxed cut off of 7.5 percentage can be considered in a type 1 diabetes with a recurrent hypoglycemia and a more liberal cut off of around 8 percentage can be considered for elderly and frail individuals so these were the conventional three targets which were proposed by ada but now they have included the time in range also very important concept what is this time in range so a1c just gives you an average plasma glucose over the last 2 to 3 months you will not get an idea regarding the glycemic variability so for example a patient who has been having plasma glucose of 100 and 300 would have an average glucose of around 200 and those with an average plasma glucose ranging from 180 to 220 will also have an uh, average glucose of 200 but those who have a plasma glucose ranging from 100 to 300 will have higher rate of complications because their glycemic variability is high so this time in range is a matrix which is identified from continuous glucose monitoring where you identify at what percentage of time of the day so you have 24 hours in a day at what percentage of this time the patient's plasma glucose belongs to a target range so the target blood glucose range in diabetes mellitus is 70 to 180 mg per deciliter for non pregnant and 63 to 140 mg per deciliter in pregnant individuals and for an average diabetes patient both for type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes as well as type 1 diabetes patient who is becoming pregnant the target time in range is 70 percentage so 70 percentage of the time the patient's plasma glucose should be ranging between 70 to 180 if the patient is non pregnant and 63 to 140 if the patient is pregnant and you have different time in range for different patient groups for elderly your time in range is at least 50 percentage and for gestational diabetes mellitus and type 2 diabetes patients who are uh, getting pregnant the time in range is more than 90 percentage so this time in range is actually the fourth metric and the fourth thing where you will have to satisfy the glycemic target okay 70 percentage for an average patient 50 percentage for elderly and more than 90 percentage for gestational diabetes mellitus now exercise and obesity there has been not much change and it is 
mentioned that around 5% weight loss improves blood glucose and more than 10% would have an effect on the long term cv mortality so they have divided the drugs with the ability to reduce the weight loss this, this is a potential mcq question also those drugs which are categorized as having very high efficacy for weight loss include semaglutide and tirzepatide so tirzepatide is a combined agonist of the glp1 and gip and high category there comes the dulaglutide and liraglutide intermediate comes the glp1 rs excluding this dula lira and sema and also the sglt2 inhibitors and neutral is metformin and dpp4 inhibitors very important metformin in some textbooks you can see it under the drugs which can reduce weight but in ada it mentions metformin as a weight neutral drug and prescribing an exercise plan for diabetes the ada says that you should engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity per week spread over at least 3 days per week okay and a resistance training in 2 to 3 sessions and flexibility training in 2 to 3 sessions not going into the uh, type 1 recommendations given by ispan now coming to the pharmacological therapy or the anti hyperglycemic agents for diabetes mellitus management so which are the conditions where you require insulin by default so those highlighted in red is given in the ada statement a1c more than 10 percentage or random plasma glucose more than 300 mg per deciliter or if the patient is having features of catabolism in the form of significant weight loss whether the patient is having ongoing ketosis or the patient is pregnant so these are the four indications listed by ada where insulin should be treated as the anti hyperglycemic agent by default and the other three is mentioned in the rss bi guidelines for indian population but again this makes sense just because the ada has not mentioned it it doesn't mean that you should not start insulin on other circumstances and this the a1c more than 9% with three or more ohs it is quite understandable that you have to resort to insulin and in patients with liver failure or renal failure even though the ada has not mentioned it it you it from your common sense and your knowledge it is well known that you will have to resort to insulin for glycemic control and of course in perioperative patients so you will have to keep in mind the list of conditions where you will have to use insulin up front for controlling your plasma glucose now the pillars of diabetes mellitus management or i would say the most important slide in today's presentation so previously the diabetes mellitus management was just about controlling the plasma glucose levels now as you can see it is only one among the four pillars so because the most common cause of death in diabetes which is the macrovascular disease the cvds the ca cvas all is dependent more on the comorbidities of diabetes rather than the plasma glucose alone so the blood pressure management the lipid management and the agents to improve the cardiovascular renal benefit becomes whole more important along with the anti hyperglycemic agents so we'll have to have a close look at those aspects also so this is the current ada algorithm for choosing the anti hyperglycemic therapy so previously one major change which has occurred is that they would have included the lifestyle behavior the diet exercise as well as metformin as the first line therapy for type 2 diabetes patients so here in this line they had metformin also till the previous one or two editions now they have switched metformin into the uh, lower strata and once you want to start a drug for controlling plasma glucose in a patient you divide it into two categories first category is whether the patient is having high risk for cardiovascular disease or high risk for ckd so all the risk categorizations is given in the guidelines you can go through that or the detailed video will be uploaded in the app you can go through that also so those with cardiovascular and renal issues those are coming to the category 1 and category 2 is when the plasma glucose elevation and weight gain is your major concern so if your major concern is cardiovascular or renal issues you have to have sglt2 inhibitor or a glp1 receptor agonist or a combination of both that is the essence of all this half if you have cvd cva or risk factors for that or you have risk factors or in fact you are having a uh, renal dysfunction you will start the patient on sglt2 inhibitor or a glp1 receptor antagonist agonist or a combination 
or else if the patient is just having hyperglycemia with no other risk factors and just weight loss or weight uh, loss is your uh, target then you can choose for anything based on the weight loss efficacy the glycemic reduction potential you can choose the uh, the metformin the sglt2 inhibitors the glp1 rase the, the uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitor the sulfonylureas that you can uh, go through this chart and you can look at the hierarchy of the glycemic reduction potential as well as the potential to cause weight loss okay so the first approach you have to divide the patient into two just like i have mentioned now coming to the management of hypertension the ada 2022 has put forth the standard cut off of 140 90 in patients with low cardiovascular risk and 130 80 if the patient has got a moderate cardiovascular risk or the 10 year ac with a risk of more than 15 percentage but now in the 2023 guidelines they have revised such a way that 130 80 is the target blood pressure across all age groups and across all risk categories of type 2 diabetes that is one major revision they have made and in patients who are having albuminuria or an history or risk factor of cardiovascular disease ACE inhibitor or ARB is the preferred anti hypertensive medication so this is the uh, flow chart they have given if the initial bp is more than 130 80 but less than 160 100 you start with one agent and if it is more than 160 100 you start with two agent and which is the agent you will choose you look into two aspects the cardiovascular profile of the patient and the renal profile if the patient has got risk factors or in fact affection of these two arms then you start the patient on ace inhibitor or arb okay or else you can start either ace inhibitor or arb or a calcium channel blocker or diuretics but in our practice ras blockade with ace inhibitor or arb is by far the most commonly prescribed medication followed by a non followed by a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker okay. now about the lipid management a very very overlooked area in diabetes management so one of the studies conducted from our center has shown that the patients who are eligible for statins are getting in only 20% of the cases so 80% of the time you are often not prescribing statin for a diabetes mellitus patient who is eligible for the therapy so what does ada say about the primary prevention primary prevention means the patient has not developed cardiovascular event and you are giving statin so age 40 to 75 years even if the patient is having no cardiovascular risk factor you should give a moderate intensity statin to keep an ldl goal of less than 100 mg per deciliter so the take home message is if the patient is diagnosed with diabetes his ldl target is less than 100 irrespective of the risk in a normal person without diabetes you know that the normal ldl is less than 130 but for a diabetes mellitus patient even without any other risk factor the target should be less than 100 okay now if the patient is a middle aged person aged 40 to 75 with at least one or more cardiovascular risk factors that risk factor could be hypertension could be smoking could be albuminuria could be a strong family history of cardiovascular disease so if at least one factor is there then the patient is should be having high intensity statin again this is a modification previously they have mentioned only moderate intensity statin for primary prevention now they have insisted on starting high intensity statin and the target should be less than 70 mg per deciliter as you know most of our patients would be coming under this category they would have at least one more additional cv risk factor so all of these should be receiving high intensity statin so high intensity statin means atorva of 40 mg or 80 mg or rosva statin of 20 or 40 mg but from our experience it has been shown that the asian population doesn't require as much as a higher dose of statins for a similar degree of ldl reduction compared to caucasian population so at least probably a 20 mg of statin would be enough for our population but our target ldl value could be kept in mind it should be less than 70 mg per deciliter and in age 20 to 39 years even in young patients it is reasonable to initiate statin if they have got cv risk factors and if the patient is above 75 years then you will have to discuss with the patient regarding the possible benefit and risk and the statin therapy should be started only after that now for secondary prevention 
in all patients with history of cardiovascular disease you should give high intensity statin therapy and the target should be less than 55 mg per deciliter so we have three ldl targets diabetes with no risk factor it is 100 with one or more risk factor it is 70 if the patient has got previous cardiovascular disease it is 55 so these three values you should keep in mind and if the patient is having other risk factors on statins but is having triglycerides more than 135 mg per deciliter you can start the patient on icosapent which is an omega 3 fatty acid and triglyceride more than 500 you have to have to initiate fibrates due to risk of pancreatitis now coming to cardiovascular risk reduction so we have primary and secondary prevention primary prevention means you are controlling or you are preventing the cardiovascular events who never had a cva or a cvv or a povd whereas secondary prevention is you are trying to prevent the reoccurrence of vascular events so primary prevention means you will have to address several of the risk factors which are the control of hypertension achieve the above mentioned lipid goals the use of aspirin avoidance of smoking and using drugs with cv reduction potential so which are those drugs if the patient has got any risk factor for heart failure or if the patient is in fact having features of heart failure then sglt2 inhibitors is the preferred one or if the patient is just having a coronary artery disease or a povd you can either start the patient on sglt2 inhibitors or glp1 ra or a combination of both so in patients if your primary aim is cardiovascular risk, risk reduction he should have either of these two drugs or combination in his prescription that is very important now what is the use of aspirin in diabetes secondary prevention there is no question regarding the utility all patients who have developed the cardiovascular event must be on aspirin therapy now what about primary prevention in diabetes if ada clearly mentions that if the patient's age is more than 50 years and he or she is having any of these risk factors you can consider or the the panel suggest the use of aspirin although the evidence is not very strong but if you start aspirin on this group of patients your action is justified as per guidelines so more than 50 years with any of these cardiovascular risk factors you can start aspirin at a dose of 75 mg per day low dose aspirin to prevent the cardiovascular events now for secondary prevention again it is known to all of you the use of aspirins statins prevention avoidance of smoking use of ras blockers then beta blockers they mention that at least 5 years of beta blocker use should be there and also the glp1 receptor agonist or sglt2 inhibitor now ckd risk assessment again uh, you know about the monitoring tools the urine albumin as well as the gfr assessment with creatinine and you have the beautiful chart which categorizes the patients current status based on the gfr and albumin you can uh, revise that once more from uh, your guidelines now what are the agents to be used in patients with ckd either albuminuria or a gfr less than 60 ace inhibitor or arb it is well aware sglt2 inhibitor one important point that you have to keep in mind is that now the threshold for using sglt2 inhibitor has been lowered to 20 ml per minute previously it was it was 30 the dapa ckd trial has reduced it to 25 and now the mta kidney trial which has uh, which was published recently has reduced the threshold even further to 20 so those with gfr up to 20 can be safely initiated on sglt2 inhibitor and those patients with an urine albumin of more than 200 mg per gram are also eligible for sglt2 inhibitor therapy and one more drug has been added to the therapeutic armamentarium which is fenrinon which is a non steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist it prevents both the progression of diabetic nephropathy as well as the progression of cardiovascular events in patients with diabetic kidney disease and it can be used in those with a gfr more than 25 and potassium of less than 5 at a dose of 10 or 20 mg of course the complication is the gfr worsening and hyperkalemia now few words about non alcoholic fatty liver disease It is said to be present when the fatty infiltration occurs in more than five percent of the hepatocytes. You call it as NASH. When as in, along with fatty infiltration, if there is inflammation and hepatocyte ballooning, you call it as NASH. 
and how do you assess for the presence of NAFLD? You can use SGOT, SGPT, and very important non-invasive monitoring is a FIP4 score, which is advocated by ADA, which uh, has four parameters, age, SGOT, SGPT, and vital count. This is an important potential MCQ for your upcoming exams. FIP4 score, which of the following is not a component? A question like that can be asked. Then also you can do the fibroelastography, where you get an idea regarding the stiffness of the liver, which is a surrogate marker of liver fibrosis. And the value more than 10 is suggestive of, more than 12 is suggestive of fibrosis and less than 8 is normal. So this is FIP4 calculator. So as a internal medicine resident, all of you can make the habit of calculating the FIP4 calculator. So it is available in all the med med medicine calculators like the MedCal and all. And FIP4 is available as a specific app in your app store. So you can enter all these values, four values, and you can get it. So this is a non-invasive method for assessing the fibrosis status of the liver. So more than 2.6, it suggests significant fibrosis and needs an urgent referral to the gastroenterologist. And what are the measures with which you can control NAFLD? One is weight loss of 5 to 10 percentage, bioglitazone in diabetes mellitus patients, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonist. So, so far, GLP-1 RA and bioglitazone have the greatest evidence of NAFLD benefit in type 2 diabetes. And of that, semaglutide has the highest uh, fat, the, the hepatocyte steatosis and uh, steatohepatitis improving potential. It is for semaglutide. Now, the summary of this session, I know that there are a lot of areas to be covered, the diabetes complications and all, how to screen, how to monitor for them, but that need a very ex extensive and exhaustive discussion and the detailed videos will be uploaded in the doc tutorials app. So as a take home message, I just want you to pass on one important information which I've already mentioned. The diabetes management is not just the control of plasma glucose. You will have to address the blood pressure, the lipids, and the cardiovascular risk, and you will have to manage and follow up the patient accordingly. So I think uh, this session was of use for you. And in, if, in case of any doubt, you can post the questions in the chat box. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ravi Shah was uh, asking, where is it mentioned, sir, that high risk to be started to be screened from 10 years of age. That is in the pediatric. I have not touched the uh, pediatric diabetes aspect. There is a specific area called type 2 diabetes in young patients. So there was a previous question in your entrance also. Said from what age onwards should you consider screening for type 2 diabetes? And it is clearly mentioned in the guidelines that it is from 10 years of age. And if a patient who is more than 10 years of age, who is overweight and obese with any of the risk factors, they should undergo uh, type 2 diabetes screening with any of the methods. But it is not mentioned under the, under the adult guidelines and it has not been highlighted in the current guideline also. But just for passing on the information, uh, I have mentioned that 10-year cutoff. It is mentioned under the pediatric diabetes mellitus area. So any other questions? So uh, if there are no more questions. So I just want to introduce you to the NEAT SS program, which is offered by the doc tutorials. We have so many great, great faculties, very knowledgeable and very interactive faculties in our faculty group. And we provide as a group a, a, a video lectures, the quick revision videos, which was an instant hit once we released it last year. And uh, Elite. Uh, video discussion is there, test and discussion. You, have, you can get access to the Q Bank with all the possible questions for your upcoming entrances. And also, we have also included the previous year paper discussion also. And we are also planning to uh, include the Harrison based the table and chart discussion, uh, which would be a great addition to your preparation. And uh, Dr. Surya has posted one question. What is the current treatment of NAFLD in non-diabetic patients? So regarding the patient, the management of NAFLD, so far there has been no agent which is approved by the FDA. So there is no FDA approved agent for management of NAFLD. 
and by far the most strongest evidence is for weight reduction more than 10 percentage weight loss has been linked with not only improvement in steatosis but also steatohepatitis and to a degree of fibrosis also so weight loss is the cornerstone for therapy and in non diabetic patients you can have a trial of vitamin e also vitamin e at 400 to 800 international units per day has been found to reduce the steatosis and partly steatohepatitis and apart from that there are a lot of agents in the pipeline for example the ppar agonist the ppar alpha and uh, gamma dual agonist pan ppar agonist you have the monoclonal antibodies against so many molecules which inside the inflammation are all in pipeline you have the obeticolic acid you have elafibrinor but none has been approved by the fda so in our practice what we use is that you advise vigorous lifestyle modification we give vitamin e and we give ppar what is readily available for us is the saroglitazar which is a dual ppar agonist which can reduce the hepatic steatosis as well as control the lipid profile of the patients and of course uh, sgld2 inhibitors as evidence even in non diabetic individuals for control of steatosis so is glp1 receptor agonist so they are potential uh, few uh, therapeutic options in the future even in those who are not having hyperglycemia so you can always be in touch with me this is my whatsapp number shown in the uh, image and i'm having separate groups for daily discussion of the mcq points uh as well as case based scenarios and to clear all your doubts i have two separate groups one is for neat ss and one for ini ss endocrinology and uh, this is the qr code for gaining entry to that group so those who are not already members on the group can you scan this qr code to get entry to this app and i'll be posting the latest updates daily questions and we'll have a lot of fruitful discussion in the group and of course if you have any personal queries regarding the preparation or any doubts regarding any clinical cases or the issues that you encounter in the ward you can um, available at whatsapp all the time you can feel free to contact me so i hope the session was useful for you and uh, in case of any queries you can message me in this number and i think and uh, i should thank you for your patient listening thank you have a good day